there's only one way to transition out of that. Please stand in honor of God who has given us his word as a treasure, and I will read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 15 today. The Apostle Paul writes, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See to it that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. This is the word of God. Please be seated. We're moving towards the end of First Thessalonians, of course, because First Thessalonians has how many chapters? Five. And where are we? Chapter 5, verse 12. So that's just not a whole lot left, but we have today and next Sunday and the following Sunday to finish up this uh, incredible letter that God has gifted to his church for 20 centuries now. And we can benefit from it just as the Thessalonians who first received it benefited from it as well. Um, it's important to point out, as we've tried to point out bit by bit, week by week, that the Apostle Paul is providing here in this letter uh, a lot of affirmation and relationship and instruction, beginning in chapter 1, moving all the way through to chapter 5. Uh, there's just information, instruction, affirmation. That's what Paul's emphasis is. And that's a pattern that Paul often employs in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 are talking about all that they have that is theirs in Christ. And then beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, I urge you, therefore... Walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And so the indicatives, the facts, fill three chapters of Ephesians, and then come the commands, the imperatives, in the last three chapters. Likewise, if you've been uh, tuning in and uh, walking along with us through 1 Thessalonians, uh, you'll keep in mind that the first command shows up in this letter in chapter 4, verse 18. And it's a pretty easy one. Encourage one another. Likewise, the same command shows up in Ephesians, not Ephesians, in 1 Thessalonians. This is where we are. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, encourage one another. But he adds something to it. and Build up one another, as you already are doing. Okay. So, so far the commands have been kind of light. <laughs> not, not real you know, heavy-duty kind of commands. And, uh, and that's an encouragement. If you, if you run into people in your work or in your neighborhood who think that what Christianity is all about is a whole set of things not to do, don't do these things, or a whole set of things to do, be sure you do these things. Well, there are commands, but in this letter to a new church, the Apostle Paul spends four chapters and 11 verses before he even pulls out of his sack a, a, a good functioning imperative and says, here, who throw this at you. I want you to do this. Paul is moving very slowly in this process because he reminds them again and again and again of what God has done and what God has promised and who our God is. He's our Savior, our Redeemer, the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is what God has accomplished. And in chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, chapter 5, 1 through 11, Paul is focusing on the end and the hope that they can have, that we can have, as we consider the end of our lives, the end of our friends' lives, or the end of the world as we know it. And Paul is focusing on that hope. And so there is an overflow of hope. That's where we come to today. In chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, he focuses on what's the problem with maybe people have died. And he uses that euphemism, they've fallen asleep. They have died, and so the people in Thessalonica were a little bit concerned. What's going to happen to Uncle Bob? What's going to happen to my friend who has gone? And 
Jesus hasn't returned yet. And Paul comforts them and encourages them and reveals to them by a word from the Lord, this is what's going to happen. The Lord most certainly will gather all of his own together and we will be forever always with the Lord. That's a great hope. In the expectation of God's deliverance and God's gathering people together, that's something that he says, encourage one another with these words. What you've experienced in terms of the end of someone's life, it's not the end. There's more to come. And likewise, last week in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11, Paul focuses on the reality of the coming judgment. There is a coming day of the Lord, a phrase that the Jews of that day were very familiar with, appearing over 200 times in the Old Testament scriptures. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment and wrath and sudden destruction, but all with a purpose, to bring blessing. That the same God who will bring destruction on those who have opposed him, are hostile to him, hostile to his people, persecuting Christians around the world, the Lord is going to bring that kind of cataclysmic, catastrophic judgment. But in order to do that, and he will do that in order to deliver his own people. At the end of 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 10, verse 9 and 10, he says, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. And so there's a distinction. There's two kinds of people that are there. It's those who are opposed to God who will experience the judgment, but you who are here know that you're not destined for that wrath to come. And that's the good news that all of our sins, as you look around the world today, as you think about the ways in which perhaps you've been injured, wounded, instead of reverting to bitterness, Paul reminds us that God is a just and holy God and every sin that you have committed, that I've committed, that other people have done against us, every single one of those is either going to be paid for at the cross, already paid for, or in eternity in hell. Judgment is real. God is the one who has promised that and will do it. And so the call for us is to be are you in or are you out? Are you in Christ or are you out of Christ? You can't straddle that fence. You can't be on both sides. Are you in or are you out? This is the overflow of hope. If we have that kind of hope, hope that goes beyond the, the limits of physical life on this planet, hope that goes beyond our capacities to bring about justice in the earth, if we have that kind of hope, does that have any implication at all for how we ought to live? Sure it does. Sure it does. And it's bigger than just encourage one another. Paul begins to say, this is how this ought to shape your life. This is how your life can look different because you are different. And he begins with some requests in chapter 5 and verse 12. For the grammar nerds, I want to point out this. There are no imperatives in verse 12. Okay? He says, we ask you to respect that's an infinitive, okay? We ask you to respect those who labor, those who are over you, and those who admonish you. We ask you to esteem them, and we then gives us a command, an imperative, be at peace. Well, the requests are these. With regard to the leaders, he gives us three descriptive phrases. Those who labor among you, those who are over you in the Lord, those who admonish you. And I want you to think in terms of a narrow application and a broad application. When you think about your leaders, your mind may go to, well, me as pastor, David or Mark as elders, or, and it may not go any wider than that. But he says, with regard to your leaders, this is those who labor among you. And so that's where the wider application comes. Think about others who are laboring in that position of responsibility, whether it's a small group leader, it could be a friend who's discipling you one-on-one, -on -one. it could be someone who's challenging you to consider the reality of Christ in this world. He says, I want you to have a certain attitude towards them, those who labor among you. Notice that there's a sense of labor. That is that, that there's good work being done. There's hard work being done. There's toilsome labor and struggle that's happening on behalf of Christians. And so here's a, an encouragement to you. 
When you read this verse, don't just think about the elders in the local church. Think about that person who is engaged with your life and say, this is how God wants me to regard that individual, those individuals. Okay, that could be for some of you in the room. I'm looking at one right now. It could be your parents. Okay, it could be a friend. It could be a classroom teacher. It could be anyone who is engaged in that way. And notice what he says. Those who labor among you. Okay, so there are people watching this on YouTube right now. I know most of you, and I wish you would be able to be here because that's the key point. They labor among you. And so as valuable as watching something on a screen is and effective as a teaching tool, it's still not the same as being face-to-face -face with someone. It's a shadow and it's reality. Back when I was a little goober, my father was a science teacher in a junior high school, 7th, 8th, ninth grades in Cincinnati, Ohio. And in Cincinnati, they kind of caught on to technology and they thought, well, you know, we could use television to teach. Wow, modern technology. So there's my father teaching science in the classroom, and then he'd turn on the television, and we had our very own WCET, Cincinnati Educational Television. What a creative acronym, okay? WCET on channel 48 would beam science instruction from Dr. Stephen Smalley into the junior high classrooms of Cincinnati. And my dad would sit and watch Dr. Stephen Smalley, and then he would talk. And it was a collaborative effort. That was that. I, believe it or not, when I was six years old, was a television personality. <laughs> Don't laugh too hard. Uh, we had, again, on WCET, because television is the way to teach. They gathered some kids from my little elementary school and we went out to the studios, and with Mrs. Field, one of the teachers from our school, we taught other children how to read. Like, that was really not very effective, I don't think. Mrs. Field did most of the teaching, but we were there, and we participated and played games and things like that. That was not face-to-face. -face. We were laboring for them, and my father, along with Dr. Stephen Smalley, were working together, but we weren't laboring among them. Learning is a personal and relational exercise, and we can't forget that, being involved. Those who labor. And then he says another descriptive phrase about these leaders, those who are over you in the Lord. That has some negative connotations. My overlord. Oh, you know, it's just kind of a, 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 an awesome kind of domination that comes along with that. It's not what he's talking about here. Those who are over you, there is an order and a sequence, and there are, just like there are in your companies and in your communities, there's a certain order to things. And so there's some that are over and some that are over at a lower level. Every one of us fits into that order. But the thing that he's describing here is... It's a, a wonderful word that describes being out in front, which is where those who are over ought to be. There's nothing more frustrating to a, a project community for somebody to be sitting in the back saying, hey, you guys need to go, or for a military commander to say, yeah, you know, we need some help down there, over there, we need some artillery. And, uh, and uh, meanwhile, I'm over here in my bunker shaking. That, that's, that's no leadership. The one who is out in front, who takes responsibility, who takes the lead and makes the project go, who directs the battle in person, not from the back bench, but out front. So those who are laboring among you, those who are over you, those who are out in front taking that leadership responsibility seriously, and those who admonish you. When was the last time you were admonished? That's a word that we don't use very often. It's kind of a fancy Bible word. Okay? Warn. Warn. Get someone's attention. Okay? So 
Let's make believe that Joshua here is doing something with a fire at home, okay? And the fire is starting to mm, go down a little bit. And so Joshua says, I know how to make this fire get stronger. I've got some lighter fluid. And he's going to throw the lighter fluid, or better yet, gasoline, onto that fire. And what does mama say? She says, oh, this should be interesting, yes. No, mama admonishes him quickly. She warns him. She pulls him back. Don't do that. Admonishment is important. And the reality is, I look around the room and I look at myself, we don't admonish very well. That word's coming up later in this text, so we'll spend some more time looking at that. But admonish you. That's what leaders are supposed to do. The elders of the church, one of our responsibilities is to warn those who are in danger. And that's what Paul says. Labor, be out in front, and sound the alarm when necessary. So those are the descriptions of those leaders. And remember, the wider circle points to not just official leaders in a local church, but to anybody who's meaningfully engaged in your life and walk in the Lord. Keep that in mind. But what are the requested actions? Those two infinitives and one imperative. First, he says, respect. This is a hard concept to translate, and I, I want to illustrate that for you. The, the Phillips translation says, get to know. That sounds very casual. Hey, let's, let's have a coffee, Ken. Yeah, you, you need to get to know me, you know? Um, but that's not what he's talking about. To give recognition to. The uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible suggests that. Uh, the Living Bible, the message in the New Living Translation says honor. The New American Standard says appreciate. A round of applause for our leaders. You know, uh, what's going on here? Give attention to. King James Version very wonderfully literally says no. Hmm. Respect comes from the ESV and the NIV. The NIV, the new version uh, from 19, 2011, says acknowledge. I like that. German, erkennen. Hmm. Or anerkennen in the Neue Genfer Übersetzung. Okay, so we got some kennen. I like those kennen words because that connects with no, which connects with knowledge, which connects with acknowledge, which is what's talking about here. It's not simply just show respect. It's not just show appreciation. Write him a note once in a while. Say thank you to your small group leader. No, it's to know him. We are to know the Lord, which is to recognize his authority, recognize his position, his right to rule. We recognize him. We know him. And so we are to know in the same way those who are surrounding us. We are to know those who are leading. Knowing God is a biblical shorthand, not for being a theological genius and being able to list attributes and proof texts, but knowing God is theological shorthand for you are in a covenantal relationship with God as your Lord and you know him. And he knows you. The book of Isaiah begins with Isaiah lamenting that an ox knows its master. But my people do not know. That is to say, when you go out to the barn in the morning to feed your oxen, they know you, they recognize you, they see you as the source of their provision and protection. But my people, the Lord says, they don't know. They've disregarded him. They've ignored him. They've turned aside from him. Likewise, the Lord knows. The Lord knows those who are his, Scripture declares. In Psalm 1 and verse 6, it says, The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows our ways. He knows us intimately. He's initiated that covenant relationship with us. And I'm taking time to expand on this so that you understand and can grasp that we're not talking about here just a 
a short little measure of respect or honor or appreciation, but to recognize that God has put this person, this person, this person, this person, this person in my life. And part of my knowledge of God is to recognize their role individually in my life. He says, I ask you. He's being soft, indirect. I ask you to respect or to know, to acknowledge. Secondly, he says, I ask you to esteem them highly in love. When, when Paul uses that idea of esteem, he's looking to the, the way in which we recognize, again, we have an estimate or a consideration of that individual. We say that this is one whom I consider in this way. In Isaiah 66, the Lord says, this is the one whom I will esteem, the one who is humble and contrite in heart and who trembles at my word. He says, I consider you this way. I want to consider this. I want to regard you in this way. Paul uses the word in Philippians chapter 2 that we ought to consider one another as more important than ourselves. Again, in chapter 2 in Philippians, he says in verse 6 that the Lord Jesus Christ did not consider equality with God something to be grasped at. And then when Paul says in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is honorable, he says, I want you to consider these things. Have a high regard for them. And so the request is to know and then to esteem, to regard. James chapter 1 and verse 2 Count it all joy. That's our word again. Consider it all joy when you encounter these trials. But he says, esteem them. But then he comes in with a marvelous adverb. Highly. And if I would have the opportunity to do battle with the ESV translation team, I'd want to do battle at this moment. Say, come on, guys. This is a better, better word than highly. I hold you in high esteem. That's a very formal way. This is a, a wonderful compound adverb, and it's a, a, a word that we've seen before in this text, where he said to them before, in chapter 3 and verse 12, and chapter 4 and verse 1, I want you to do so more and more. He's talking about the overflow and the abundance of love. And so he says here, I want you to esteem them super abundantly in love. I, I, I want you to go overboard in your expressions of love. This is, a, this is a word that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine. That's what we're looking at here. He says, I'm requesting you, regard those who have influence in your life in this way. Exceeding abundance of love. Again, not just a little trickle here and there, not a, not a 50 cent piece, not a euro coin, you know, but stacks of 200s in love. Okay, That's the expression of currency. I've got a slide to show you, something that Dane Ortland has written in his book, Meek and Lowly, or Gentle and Lowly. And this is the extent of love. It just contrasts. He says, we love until we are betrayed. Yeah, I've experienced that. You have too. Jesus continued to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we are forsaken. Contrast, Jesus loved through forsakenness. We love up to a limit. Jesus loves to the end. That's our model. That kind of overflowing commitment and demonstration of love which Christ did for us when we were his enemies, unworthy, sinful, hating him, hating one another. Christ came and died in the place of sinful people. Okay. Know those who labor among you. Respect them. Esteem them highly in love. And then he switches to a direct command. 
be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace. That's a plural command, which that doesn't mean that David can sit here in the front row and say, this day on a Sunday afternoon in November, I am at peace. That would be very nice for David, but that's not what Paul's commanding. Paul is commanding us to be at peace among yourselves. That means where there is conflict, where there is strife, where there is bitter jealousy, where there is worldly wisdom, where there are any of those factors in operation, Paul says, you've got a responsibility. I'm giving you a command now. Be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace. Be the kind of people who use the gospel message to establish connection and to make peace, not who use gospel truth to bludgeon one another. God calls us to peace. We've been called to that. That's our responsibility. And the, here's the wonderful thing. I'm going to speak now as your pastor, a leader, one who labors among you, one who is out in front, one who sometimes admonishes you. That's my weakest spot. I am such a wimp, okay? We'll get to that. But what I want to say to you right now is this. When you are at peace with one another, that makes my job as a leader, a pastor, an elder, so much more joyful. You understand that? Because I see the gospel at work in your lives as you are meshed together as unlikely friends in this community, and the gospel is loved, treasured, Christ is adored, and obedience is a good fruit. Be at peace among yourselves. That is a great way to fuel the leader's willingness, eagerness to labor and to be out in front and to admonish. And that feeds back into Hebrews 13, 17, which I would encourage you to look at. Hebrews 13, 17 is one of those commands that as many pastors that I know, including myself, well, this is a tough passage to preach because you get out in front and say, obey your leaders. That sounds a little bit harsh, but it's in the Bible. It's black and white, obey your leaders. But then what he follows up with, he says, and, and let them do this with joy. For the opposite of joy, he says, is groaning. And if your leaders are leading with groaning, he reminds the readers in Hebrews, of oh, what benefit is that to you? None. And so when a congregation, a family, a work group is at peace among themselves, those who are leading, those who are laboring, those who are admonishing can find encouragement. Well, he moves from just simple requests in verses 12 and 13 to some urgent prescriptions for various ailments and illnesses. Whoa, the doctor is in the room. Dr. Paul is telling us how we ought to respond. And as you know, as a patient or as a healthcare worker, diagnosis is a huge part of the issue. And so we've got to diagnose the situations that we're faced with before we know which solution to apply. When I moved to Germany in 1999, I experienced, shortly after arrival, I experienced some severe back pain. And I, I'd had it before in my life with that shooting pain that just goes down the leg. The sciatic nerve was being... And I thought, ah, so I went to see my local doctor in Eichenau, and he suggested that I go see an orthopedic guy. And I went to see the orthopedic guy, and here I am, you know, hallo, ich heiße Steve. And so I, how do I talk to this guy? What do I do? I described my symptoms to him, and he, says, he looked at me, and he says, eh, you've got scoliosis. I said, do what? That's a curvature of the spine. I said, nobody's ever said that before. I said, what do I do about it? He said, nothing. Just get used to it. Live with it. I 
existed. What a doctor. I didn't like that diagnosis. It was a false diagnosis, I'm happy to report. I went to another doctor and then found out that indeed I had a, uh, a disc protrusion that was touching that, and I had surgery and fixed that. And so I stand before you as a man who's been fixed partially by surgery. Diagnosis matters. And so when he says, I want you to do this to the idle, the unruly, or to the faint-hearted, or to the weak, if you use the wrong treatment on the disease, you're going to mess things up. You're going to mess things up. And notice, these are all plural commands. And is Paul writing these commands to Timothy and Silas, to the elders of the church at Thessalonica? This is the moment in the service where you move your head side to side. No, he's writing it to you and you and you and you and you and you and you. Now here comes the urgent command. We urge you, brothers, admonish, encourage, help. All of these are present tense imperatives, just like be at peace, which means it's an ongoing work. It's something that's never going to stop. You're going to have to continually be doing this. These are some things that you want to strap on to your tool belt so that you can use them in your relationships with one another. Admonish. Warn. Sometimes that's necessary. And who's it necessary for? The one who is unruly. The one who is, some translations will say, idle. Uh, it's, a, it's a word that's used in military contexts, and so a, a marvelous set of words that all talk about order and arrangement. And so this person is out of order. If you can imagine a, a military procession with soldiers all dressed in their armaments and they're marching past, and there's one guy who's, whoa, doo -doo, doo -doo. he's out of order. Okay, he's not doing right. He's not doing the right thing. Likewise, it's when you take your three children to the top of a mountain and one of your kids gets dangerously close to the edge. Ooh. Out of order, out of line. And that's when the warning comes. Get back in here. If you go to that person who's unruly, out of order, rebellious, inattentive, and you say, well, you know, they're there. You know, every one of us has our own little set of quirks. And, you know, you have some good days and some bad days. And so let me just see what happens as you keep on walking out of line. You're going to encourage that. This is what I've seen it with children. In a classroom, I've seen it. In families, I've seen it. You've got a two-year-old who says, I must have this my way. Two-year-olds are known for that. And if you give in to a two-year-old, what's going to happen when he's four, six, 10, 18? By your coddling and your unwillingness to admonish, it creates that self-absorbed mentality of entitlement that I'm going to get what I want. And if I don't get it from you, I'm going to get it from someone else. And we know people like that, and those people need to be admonished. Admonish. Paul admonished. He says in Acts chapter 20, verse 31, Paul says, For three years I did not cease night and day to admonish everyone with tears. You see, admonishment is more than just giving orders, shouting commands. But it's that personal involvement that says, I weep because of what I see happening in your life. And it's my duty and my joy to admonish you. It's also used with a sense of instruct. That verse that we read in Ephesians chapter 6, fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but instead raise them up. Raise them up in the fear and the admonishment or the instruction of the Lord. Paul says in Colossians 3.16, again, it's one of those all y'all verses. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in all y'all richly. 
as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. Paul is assuming that that's the pattern of their lives. But if we try to teach or admonish without the word of God, the word of Christ dwelling in us richly, then we're not going to bear much fruit. Admonish. The words used in Titus, noun form, Titus chapter 3 and verse 9, where Paul says, concerning a divisive man, warn him once. Give him a second warning. After that, have nothing to do with him. See, these are serious responsibilities where we don't tolerate ongoing wickedness. But it needs to be warned. It needs to be admonished. But see, you wouldn't want to do that to the next group. Encourage the faint-hearted. The faint-hearted, this is a word that's used once in the New Testament. Literally, you would translate it, this is the person who is small-souled. He's just kind of hmm, a shrunken violet on the wall. Okay, oh. Tender. This is where in Isaiah it describes a servant as a bruised reed he will not crush. Jesus recognizes that small soul, whether because you've been wounded by somebody, because you've been neglected by somebody, because there's some deficit, something was missing in your life that resulted in a developmental delay spiritually, soulishly. Paul says, to those, we need to come alongside. We need to invest personal energy in, which is worlds different from admonishment and warning. Someone who's small-souled, you clap your hands and say, hey, get with it, come on. That is not going to be effective in drawing that person out to walk in faith. Likewise, with regard to the weak. Those who are weak could be translated sick. Those who are struggling, those who do not have the capacity do not have the power. Those who are weak, he says, I want you to help them. I want you to help them. I want you to be, if, if we could translate it this way, give you a picture, I want you to be devoted to them. To help means that you, you come up to and you attach yourself to that person. That the person needs help. And so you don't just say, come on, let's go, let's go, get, get moving, get moving, come on. No, you're going to have to attach yourself there and get the person. This is what David Keep, who's probably not watching today, but David Keep would do this on the ski slopes. Somebody would be up at the top of the ski slopes and realize, I'm stuck. And you know what David Keep would do? He would come along and he'd just grab the person, and David, an expert skier, well, just bring that person back down to solid ground. And that wasn't me, okay? But that's what David would do. That's helping the weak. That's attaching yourself to someone and bringing them to safety. Help the weak. That word devoted that I suggested, that's the way it's translated in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and be devoted to the other attached to, connected to. Titus chapter 1 and verse 9 describes the elder this way, that he must hold firm, be attached to, hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. You see that? So when someone needs help, you know, well, yeah, well, let's see if I, I got some spare change, I'll give you some help. No, 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 that's not help. Someone needs help, you come alongside them and they're weak and they need you. Do that. But here's what he says, too. No matter what your physician-style diagnosis may be, you may look at a friend, a family member, and say, wow, you're out of line. Or, you know, you, you're discouraged. You're small-souled. You're, you're faint-hearted. Weariness has gotten to you. Or you may look at someone and say, wow, you're really weak and powerless. In all of those cases, Paul says, be patient with everyone. 
Do we have any impatient admonishers in the room? How many times do I have to tell you? Okay. you know, that's what my mother would say something like that. I told you once. Come on. No, he says be patient. Admonishment is important. Admonishing in love is important. Remember the overflow and the abundance of love is why we admonish. We say the word. We call, but we're patient. You know? Patient with the one who is small-souled, faint-hearted. Needs that personal investment and encouragement. Patient with the one who's weak. Patient to say, I'm here with you, I'm here for you, I'm going to get you to the end. We urge you, brothers and sisters, to do these things. Admonish, encourage, help. Be patient. He also throws in two more, and next week, Paul is loaded with you know those Pancho Villa kind of you know gun belts that he's just going to unload the imperatives next week. So get ready, fasten your seatbelts. He tosses in two more in verse fifteen. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil. In any group of people, there's going to be someone who's been sinned against, possibly wounded very deeply. And one of the results of that woundedness and that sin and shame that comes from that is an unforgiveness and a bitterness. And Paul says, see to it that no one repays evil for evil. Because that's the temptation. Okay? They, they have a clinical term for this. I like the clinical term, but I don't like the practice. Revenge fantasy. Anybody ever have a revenge fantasy? You know, somebody did something to you that you didn't like, and you lie in bed at night, and you think, you know, you imagine a scenario where you go to that person, and you say, this is this is this, and they, and they just go, well, yeah, you know, you're right. And, uh, and, this, and all of those revenge fantasies, who turns out to be the winner? Yeah, you know, Me, you know, because I, in my fantasy mind, have figured out how to make this work, but reality never works that way. And that's why Paul says, don't do that. See to it that no one does that. And whose responsibility is that? Look around the room. All y'all. Okay? It's, it's not my responsibility to see that no one repays evil for evil. It's all of our responsibility to see to it that no one repays evil for evil. Paul says this in Romans chapter 12. Never, never take revenge. Paul gives a good reason in Romans 12. He says, leave it to God. Leave it to him. Because God himself says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And so every wrong, every unrighteous deed, every wickedness that has been perpetrated against you and has harmed you, God knows and God will repay. Trust him. Every time I check in the Word of God, I find that God is smarter than I am, more powerful than I am, wiser than I am, more capable in every way than I am. And that gives me hundreds of reasons to trust Him to deal with the issues of injustice that I may face in my life. Take responsibility, see to it. That's our responsibility is to see what's happening in others and maybe a word of admonishment's in order. Maybe a word of warning, maybe a word of encouragement. Maybe it's going to take attaching myself to somebody and leading them through that revenge fantasy. But then he says, but always, the contrast is always good to, to note. Never take revenge, but always seek to do good. The, the New Living Translation says, try to do good. But you know what Yoda says. There is no try. This is not, oh, I tried to do what's good. No, no, no. This is, this is a word that describes a, an intensity, a pursuit. The word is even used to translate the word persecute in the New Testament. So when you're trying to do good or seeking to do good, I want to kind of take that a quantum leap into the atmosphere. And I want us to think in terms of I am going to be so rabid in my pursuit of what is good for others. 
to everyone. Not just casual, not lazy, but intense. Pursue what is good. And why do we do this? We do this simply because, as we started, because of the overflow of hope. The overflow of hope that we have in Christ. What is your only hope in life and death? If your hope is in Christ, that certainty that Christ will return, that Christ will bring judgment on the day of the Lord, that he will bring salvation on the day of the Lord, and the certain hope that we have of being in Christ, that fuels this whole process. We can live this way. We can talk this way. We can serve one another this way because of who we are in Christ. So the question on the back of the bulletin, as I asked you to figure out earlier today, And you can pick one up or you've got a PDF in your inbox. The question to ask is, are you in or are you out? You can't be a little bit in. You're either in Christ or you're not. And so I want you to figure that out and talk to me if you need help. Really, urge you, come to Christ by faith. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you that you're here in our midst, that you've brought us together this day and that we can worship you. We thank you that we have hope in you, and that we can be in relationship with one another, to know one another, to love one another, and to abound in that opportunity. So strengthen us as we praise you, as we go out into this world in peace, because of the peace that you've brought through the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.